Good afternoon and welcome to the COVID-19 update on Channel Television. I'm Millicent Walker. Here are some of the highlights. United Nations Development Programme grants 885,500,000 Naira unconditional cash transfer to communities affected by COVID-19 in Lagos State. Imo State Government procures state-of-the-art mobile clinics to deliver free medical services across 27 local government areas. And Israeli government imposes strict sanctions against lockdown protesters as it tightens COVID-19 restrictions. The message, like yesterday, is the same today. Take responsibility, maintain physical distancing, avoid large gatherings and follow the non-pharmaceutical protocols because you may not know who may have COVID-19. According to the Nigeria Centre for Disease Control, a multi-sectoral national emergency operations centre, EOC, is still activated at level three and continues to coordinate the national response activities. After last night's numbers, a total of 50 8,647 cases are now confirmed. 49,937 recoveries have been made and no death was recorded in the last 24 hours. 187 new cases, however, were reported from 12 states and the Federal Capital Territory. Lagos State recorded the highest at 74, a slight difference from yesterday at 71, followed by Plateau State, 25 cases. Rivers was third place with another 25 as well. Gombe, 19 cases. The FCT recorded 19 cases as well. 10 cases were recorded in Oshun State, 5 in Kaduna, 3 in Bonu, 2 in Ogun State, another 2 in Katsina, and 1 each in Nasarawa, Bayelsa, and Edo State. According to the Health Minister, Dr. Sage Haniwe, about 10% of the total cases in Nigeria are below the age of 19 years, indicating that even though adults, especially those 60 years and above, are more vulnerable, complications can occur in all age groups. The Lagos State Government is still receiving support from concerned bodies to help reduce the impact of COVID-19 on its residents. This time, the support is coming from the United Nations Development Programme, UNDP, as it launches uh, a sum, unconditional cash transfer over 800 million, a project for vulnerable communities affected by COVID-19 in the state. As the world continues to grapple with the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, Nigeria seems to be easing out of the pain gradually, with strategic moves to revive the impact on the economy and its citizens. The United Nations Development Programme is one of the agencies the Lagos State Government is partnering with to elevate the impact, with the launch of the unconditional cash transfer for vulnerable communities. A major focal point is the poverty level which appears to be on the rise. 22,600 families from Lagos State will benefit from the cash transfer, while 5,500 SMEs and startups will also be funded through the business continuity and startups under this cash transfer program. Good afternoon, can you hear me? The European Union ambassador to Nigeria joins the gathering virtually, and for him, the global pandemic is yet another opportunity to address all loopholes in the health sector. If ever nobody is any more in doubt of the importance of investing in human capital and in basic social services, some of the challenges in the lack of health facilities and services in a country like Nigeria have become quite evident during a crisis like the one that we face. The Nigerian government at all levels is also not lagging in its responsibility, as clearly spelled out by the Lagos State Governor and the Senior Special Assistant to the President, on sustainable development goals. For them, support can never be too much. There's no gain saying that COVID-19 has impacted negatively on our social economic well-being as a people, especially the vulnerable segments of our population. And as a responsible and responsive government, we have implemented and will continue to implement palliative measures aimed at sustaining lives and livelihood. UNDP is indeed a reliable partner and will look forward to sustaining this 
relationship, especially at this time of decade of action. Over 22,000 Lagos residents are expected to benefit from over 800 million UNDP fund to cushion the effects of the pandemic. Titilayo Haberiowu, Channels Television News. Jigao State Government says it is considering testing all boarding students before resumption of schools across the state. The State Governor Badaro Bubakar stated this while speaking to newsmen at the State House in Dutse, the capital. According to him, the major challenge in the resumption of schools is how the students can practice physical distancing considering the numbers per class. On the resumption of school, the Commissioner of Education and his team are working. They are looking at the models in other schools and uh, by Monday we'll be able to announce uh, on when we will resume school, depending on what they study. They are all out there studying the school and looking at the models from other states and uh, so that they advise us on how we will do this properly. You see, the main issue is the classes are already congested even <laughs> before the COVID and now if you have to do social distancing, you need to create uh, three more times of the infrastructure that you have existing now. So that is the major challenge. So we are contemplating doing two rounds of teaching. In the morning, then they go, then we do others in the afternoon. Then that is the challenge of teachers. How do we separate the periods and this? And we are working heavily on it. If we have to provide the social distancing, and in the boarding school, it will be too much uh, to, to do, but we are also studying to see if we can move some, because the hostels are also there, and as long as they are in a boarding house, you cannot stop them from mixing together. Ahead of the likely resumption of tertiary institutions in Ekiti State from the 2nd of October, the schools concerned have been putting facilities and plans in place for a smooth reopening. At the Ekiti State University, management says it will be marking seats at the lecture rooms for proper spacing, while other facilities and items mandated are now in place. While at the Afe Babalola University, a private institution all seems set as the state COVID-19 task force commence its pre Assumption inspection at the university. Governor Kaede Faimi had a few weeks back announced that tertiary institutions in the state could reopen from October the 2nd, but subject to confirmation of compliance and pre preparedness. This is the first uh, visit we've had to any tertiary institution, and uh, we were anxious to come here to see what they have. They are anxious to have us come, and we've visited uh, various areas, uh, the administrative buildings, the hostel. We're ending up at the hospital here. And uh, at least my initial reaction is that uh, they have prepared well for us. And uh, we are impressed, but we'll go back with the team. I know that all of them have been making some notes. And we'll go back and discuss it within a few days. We'll come back with... Uh, our uh, verdict, but uh, I think uh, they've done well. Amid the coronavirus pandemic, the Imo State Government has procured 10 mobile clinics with state-of-the-art medical equipment to deliver free healthcare service to vulnerable indigents of the state across the 27 local government areas. While flagging off the exercise at the government house, Uwere, the Imo State Governor, Hope Zadimma, says the idea is to complement primary healthcare centres to deliver free healthcare services to the doorsteps of rural dwellers who cannot afford and access basic healthcare services. We did a medical survey as to the deaths at the rural areas. We discovered that 75% of rural deaths are avoidable deaths and can be blamed on lack of medical facilities. So in our wisdom, we decided to procure these 10 mobile clinics are all fully equipped and mixed up with any standard anywhere in the world for primary health care. We are going to deploy them to the rural areas. The target really is for medical attention to be extended 
to the vulnerable, the indigent, at the rural centers. We have a memorandum of understanding with the church. I've decided to use the church because not only that there are critical stakeholders, they are already on humanitarian grounds providing medical services to the state. Now, the World Health Organization plans to make 120 million rapid diagnostic coronavirus tests available uh, for people in lower and middle income countries. Joining us to talk more about this is Dr. Abdulaziz Bako, health policy management expert at uh, Indiana University, the United States. He joins us now via Skype. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you very much for having me. What's your take on... Um, this perhaps planned project by the WHO with regards to um, testing, massive testing, and this is for the world's poor. I think this is a, a very great uh, development. It's a, it's a very important uh, development in the fight against the pandemic. At least the test is an antigen test, which means that it looks for fragments or proteins and uh, that belong to the virus and checks for them. Um, so that means it will be a little bit less sensitive than the regular PCR test that we are very much used to. Um, however, it's a really important uh, strategy. It, it gives uh, fairly accurate results and it will help a lot in fight the pandemic to a large extent. And given it's, uh, you know, given it's, uh, the fact that it's not expensive, it's cheap, uh, that makes it even uh, a better uh, strategy to use in very much developing countries. A lot of experts have said, even though it might be fast and simple, but can we rely on it uh, with regards to locating COVID-19 and at what stage? Um, it will help to tell you that this person um, probably doesn't have the disease, but it can't tell, tell you for sure that a person is negative. That's what sensitivity means. It has lower sensitivity than the PCR test. So if a person tests negative, it's not for sure that he doesn't have the disease. Uh, they have to go through uh, the PCR test to uh, be a certain or to be sure that that person doesn't have the disease. But it gives you a picture of what you should expect. You know, um, if you are doing a massive test, then probably a lot of the people that have tested negative are truly negative. All right, let's look at um, Nigeria's efforts essentially with testing. So far, we've done over 500 uh, sample tests. Of course, we have the new um, point of care test, uh, which we understand the federal government is, is looking into in terms of uh, scaling up testing. But what's your take on, on perhaps our efforts so far? Oh, it appears we've lost uh, Dr. Bako. Hopefully, we'll try to get a hold of him. But we definitely have more stories coming your way when we return after the break. Now, troops of the Nigerian Army Sector 2 Operation Lafia Dole Damataru Yobe State have joined other Nigerians to commemorate World Heart Day, which was celebrated yesterday. Now, the frontline soldiers uh, to a five kilometer road walk, uh, they took that walk to create awareness by distributing pamphlets to the general public on the need to care for their hearts as part of uh, social, its uh, social responsibilities. According to a report, as many as 30 percent of COVID COVID-19 patients who are being admitted to hospitals are developing heart ailment or are coming uh, with heart attacks. You will believe with me for those of us that have been on, that have been very uh, alert as regards to COVID-19, that may, among those people that are vulnerable to cardiovascular disease are people that are what? Hypertensive and diabetic. So that's actually posed a big challenge to us. And it's not only COVID alone. It also affects a lot of things, like maybe somebody going to surgery, so a lot of insurance issues and so on. So this is a big problem. And one thing about this disease is that it does not, you know, give, it's not all cases. Majority of cases doesn't give signs, 
there is no warning signs at all. Cigarette smoking is a risk to any disease you can think of in the, in the body. So it's better somebody will avoid it. Eating more vegetables, low salt diet, eat, taking more fruits. Apart from these strategies, exercise is very key. That's why I see many people jogging. But you have to moderate exercise. At least minimum of like 20, 30 minutes in a day. Ordinary walking is exercise. Now, health practitioners are urging patients to not ignore chest pains or other signs related to the heart, especially as the world fights the pandemic. Dr. Safiya Aljo is a family physician. She joins us uh, for more on this from Abuja Studios. Welcome to the program. Now, heart disease and stroke, you know, is the world's leading cause of death, um, claiming over 17 million lives each year. What are the risk factors which uh, we need to avoid uh, to protect our heart? Thanks for having me. Uh, heart disease and stroke, is very, the rate is very high all over the world, and there are some predisposing factors to this. Obesity, being obese, when you're obese, put a lot of pressure on the heart. Uh, chronic illnesses, such as diabetes, hypertension, could also lead to heart diseases. Uh, uncontrolled hypertension could lead to heart attack. Uncontrolled diabetes, also lead to silent heart attacks known as, my, known as myocardial infarction. Then being obese is a risk factor to uh, myocardial infarction, which is heart attack. So I think a lot of things, even lack of exercise, reduction of salt intake will go a long way to reduce the risk of us having heart issues. So we need to indulge in a lot of exercises for at least 30 minutes to one hour a day for at least five times in a week. So that will help in preventing heart issues. And there's also a relationship. We know hypertension and stroke is related. Uncontrolled high blood pressure, people could have stroke. They just notice there is a weakness of one part of the body, deviation of the mouth to one side, and generalized body weakness. Really one part. They notice it's weaker than other parts of the body. So all these things have to do with lifestyle. When you take low salt, it reduces your, your, your chances of having uh, uh, hypertension, which could lead to heart disease. Also, when sugar is being controlled, those with diabetes, when their sugar level is being controlled, the risk of having heart attacks is low. Also, when you indulge in exercise, it will go a long way to help the heart. So I think what we should do, yesterday was the World Heart Day, to remember us to take care of our heart. The heart is a four-chambered organ, which is very important, helps to pump blood all over the body. So if the heart is not in a good shape, there's a problem. So we need to do a lot to protect our heart. Diet is an important factor when we're talking about it. Uh, you need to eat heart-friendly diet. Diets that are low in cholesterol, especially the low-density lipoprotein cholesterol, which could lead to coronary artery disease and block the heart. So what we take is we. We need to take the right diet, to help our heart, to make sure our heart is in the right state. Also, the exercise we talk about has to be mandatory. It's not something you just need to uh, think is not. It's very important, both mm. to the old and the young. So and, people and need to know Joe. that we need to take care of our heart, do the right thing at the right time. And also now there is a relationship between heart disease and uh, as, uh, uh, coronavirus, which has been shown from certain uh, studies done, that even post-COVID, people are now coming down with uh, heart issues. Post yes, but let me quickly this jump in here, Dr. Joe. Of... It reminds me of something the British Prime Minister okay. said, that the COVID-19 pandemic has sort of made him fitter. So something we could learn from there uh, as we try to protect our heart. But then... Um, Independent studies coming in from Italy, France, China are corroborating a 50% decline in admission of patients with heart ailments. And, and this is because of their family's reluctance or even themselves to go to the hospital uh, during the pandemic, which the world is still battling today. Yes, uh, a lot of people with underlying heart conditions, like um, uh, people with hypertension, diabetes and other chronic illnesses. Because of the COVID-19, they have refused to go to the hospital before because of fear of contracting the virus in the hospital uh, vicinity. So what happens is that when they are at home, their condition get worse and at the end of the day, they come down with heart failure. So I think people should take, go to the hospital, just make sure your face mask is one and also uh, other protective mechanisms. So that will help in reducing the, the number of people coming down with uh, heart failure from either COVID. We know COVID-19 virus, like other viruses, cause a direct damage to the heart, known as myocarditis, 
which is inflammation of the heart. Because there are some cytokines, immune reaction to COVID, the body is trying to mount immunity, like a fight, a response to the COVID virus, mm. known as cytokine storm. So this can cause direct, di direct damage to the lungs and the heart, known as myocarditis. So at the end of the day, we know that people who never had uh, underlying chronic condition could also come down with heart damage from COVID. So I think a lot of people should try and go to hospital, make sure they, they use their face masks and go to seek for medical care. All right. Because when you're diabetic, you're at home, you won't know when your sugar goes up. You may even develop silent MIs, which is heart attack. So you don't run away from COVID and now die from other deaths. Make sure, apart from going to the hospital, people go to the market, they go to other places. So you can't keep staying at home because of COVID and develop symptoms that may take your life. So people Indeed. should be encouraged to still go to the hospital, try to get themselves checked of sugar, uh, blood pressure, cholesterol. Cholesterol can lead to heart attack, heart failure. Right, thank you. So when uh, you have a, a lot of cholesterol in the blood, it could lead to damage to the heart vessels. A lot of danger. So I think thank people you, should just thank take you time so to much. the hospital for Always a, a pleasure to have you on the program. Dr. Sophia Ojo is a family physician joining us from Abuja. Thank you again. Now, a new law is taking effect in Israel where the government is limiting protests by citizens who are calling for Prime Minister Netanyahu's resignation. For weeks, thousands of demonstrators have called for Netanyahu to step down because of his handling of the pandemic. Here's more on the global update. Israel's parliament has approved a government-backed edict that is likely to stifle protests against Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu over alleged corruption and his handling of the coronavirus crisis. The legislation, ratified after an all-night debate in the Knesset, banned Israelis from holding demonstrations more than one kilometer from their homes, a measure the government says is aimed at curbing COVID-19 infections. Critics of the new measure, which becomes part of Israel's second national lockdown, argue that it is really intended to block protests near Netanyahu's official residence in Jerusalem. For weeks, thousands of demonstrators have gathered to call for Netanyahu's resignation. Healthcare workers in Peru took to the streets in Lima on Tuesday to protest labor conditions while out on the front lines of the country's battle with the pandemic. Protesters gathered outside the Ribagliati Hospital to demand better working conditions and pay. Meanwhile, Peruvian President Martin Vizcarra on Tuesday paid a visit to the National University of San Marcos where clinical tests of the Sinopharm vaccine against COVID-19 are taking place. Peru has recorded nearly 808,714 cases of the coronavirus, the sixth highest case load in the world. Meanwhile, North Korea's media on Wednesday said that leader Kim Jong-un reviewed anti-coronavirus measures, adding that participants found some fault in their implementation. A state-run television, KRT, aired a video of Kim holding a meeting of the ruling Workers' Party Parfut Politburo on Tuesday, September 29. KRT did not elaborate on the fault. North Korea has not confirmed any coronavirus infections and has imposed strict virus control measures, including closing its borders, although South Korea and the United States doubt that it has managed to avoid the pandemic completely. And researchers say results from an early safety study of Moderna Inc.'s coronavirus vaccine in older adults shows that it produced virus-neutralizing antibodies at levels similar to those seen in younger adults, with the side effects roughly at par with high-dose flu shots. A study published in the New England Journal of Medicine offers a more complete picture of the vaccine's safety in older adults, a group at increased risk of severe complications from COVID-19. For further updates, you can take a closer look at our website, that's channelstv.com. You find out the latest stories on COVID-19, several other stories as well at your fingertips. As a program this afternoon, thank you for watching. I'm Millicent Walker. Stay safe.